Thank you, choir. It's one of my favorite songs. I got a question for you. Have you ever got distracted? Anybody ever been distracted before? Yeah. I, yeah. Some, some of us are real good at being distracted, right? Some, some of us are a little bit better at concentrating. All right? <laughs> some, some of us are we're pros at getting distracted. Uh, I was... I was, uh, y'all go ahead and open up to Luke 10, it's on the screen. Um, I was uh, driving down the road one day, and um, I, I, was in, I was in Greenwood. I'm not going to give too many details because it might have been somebody in this room, I don't know. But, uh, but um, I don't know who it was, but I was driving down the road, I was coming by Walmart, and, uh, and they got the gas station out there in front of Walmart, and um, there was a guy, and he had been pumping his gas, and, uh, you know, pretty simple task, and, um, and he got in his car and he started to drive away and uh, he forgot something. Apparently he got distracted and as he drove away in his car he decided to take the hose with him. You know what I mean? It was still stuck in the gas tank and um, he ripped that hose right off the pump. I mean it just, I, I was, I mean I was right there, I saw it and he took off and wham, I mean just ripped it right off the pump and of course he heard it I'm sure and he hit the brakes and I kept on going and um, I didn't want that to distract me from what I was doing, uh, driving. But, uh, you know, I, I got to thinking about that, and um, I thought, what in the world happened? I mean, he had one job right there was to pump his gas and put that thing back on the, on the gas pump and then drive away, and um, something distracted him. That's the only thing I could think of. Something distracted him. I don't know what it was. And it very well could have been a good thing that distracted him. I mean, maybe his wife had texted him, and he was, um, there was something important, and he was trying to text her back and just forgot about it. Maybe, uh, maybe he was checking the oil in his, tr- in his, in his car, or, or maybe there's a tire was low on air, and he got to thinking, I need to go put some air in my tire. Could have been, those are good things. But they distracted him, even as a good thing, it distracted him from the most important thing at that point, which was pumping his gas in a way that didn't um, tear up anybody's property, or harm, put anybody in danger, um, you know, spewing gas everywhere or whatever. And so I just got to thinking about that. I thought, you know, how often in life do we get distracted even by good things? You know, even good things can distract us from what is most important. And that's really what can happen as disciples of Jesus Christ. There is one thing that is most important in our lives as, Jesus, as, as disciples of Christ, and that is Jesus. And yet so often we can find ourselves um, tempted to um, be distracted from Jesus himself. And sometimes it's really good things, even what I'll call Jesus things, that can distract us from Jesus. And so this morning, I want us to look at a couple of truths about our focus as a disciple of Jesus. And what I hope we'll see in this um, short but really wonderful account from the life of Jesus is that we ought to resolve to focus on Jesus. Not just on New Year's Day, but every day to resolve to focus on Jesus. In our passage today, in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's he's got his face set towards Jerusalem. He he knows where he's going and and what he's going to do. He's going to give up his life um, for us to forgive us of our sins. And yet on his way, he makes a stop. And this account is this stop that he makes in a certain village, and he goes into the house of a couple of sisters. Uh, We know them as Mary and Martha. And so he goes in their house, and um, in this account, in Luke's account of this stop Jesus makes, we learn um, some things about about what happens in that home, about some choices. We learn some things about the choices that these sisters made, and we see Jesus' response to these sisters. And so I want us to read um, this passage and uh, then we're going to take some min- a few minutes and look at what um, God wants us to learn today. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, 
which will not be taken away from her. Heavenly Father, as we've opened up your word this morning, God, would you open up our hearts and minds, Father, to receive what it is you want us to receive today from your word. Father, would you give us teachable spirits? Father, so often we, um, we, we think we know everything, or maybe we've heard this passage before and say, well, there's nothing for me to learn here. But God, would you just soften our hearts? Would you give us teachable spirits this morning? Um, would you help us to respond to your word in obedience? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first thing that we see is that you will be tempted to neglect Jesus. It's just that simple. In life, we're going to be tempted to neglect Jesus. Jesus. Let's take a look at this first sister, Martha. She noticed some things that she's doing. The first thing we see that she does is she welcomes Jesus into her home. Sounds like a good thing, right? Jesus is coming along, probably with his disciples, and she welcomes him and all of this ragtag bunch of guys into her home. And so she says, come on in, you know, have a seat. And then we learn that after she welcomes him, she begins to serve. Now, I don't know what all she was doing in, in serving, but we can probably make some good guesses. It's probably likely that maybe they needed their feet washed because they've been on a dusty road, and so maybe she was going to get some water for the basin to, so they could wash their feet off or wash their hands. She's probably preparing some food. I don't know if Jesus and his disciples showed up unannounced or announced. I don't know, maybe you have some relatives this Christmas season show up unannounced. I don't know, Jesus might have showed up on, unannounced, and she's thinking, all right, I'm the, I'm the hostess here, and this is my home, and so I've got to fix this food, and we've got to feed all these people. And so she's busy doing these things, probably in the kitchen or wherever, getting this food, food ready. Um, but she's serving, serving a good thing, absolutely. I mean, Jesus even taught his disciples very specifically, you are to serve one another. Jesus himself came as a servant. He said that he came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here is Martha doing something that Jesus had commanded. She's welcomed him into her home and she is serving him. And yet we don't see the response out of her, the reaction from her that we would expect. We would think she's welcomed Jesus into her home. She's serving Jesus. She ought to be joyful. There ought to be a smile on her face as she's fixing that bread or whatever she's doing, getting the water and, and serving. And yet, we see the opposite of that. Instead of her being joyful and serving Jesus who's in her home, the text says that she is basically frustrated. We see that from her response, that she is frustrated. Instead of being satisfied in serving Jesus, her serving Jesus has actually led to her becoming frustrated. So where do we see her frustrated? Well, we see that in what she says and what she does. Now, I can only imagine, I can only imagine that she is there in the kitchen, she's fixing the food, and she looks up, and what does she see her sister doing? Well, it depends on whose perspective you are looking at it from. From the biblical perspective, from Jesus' perspective, from Mary's perspective, where is Mary? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Is that what Martha sees? No. In Martha's mind, what is Mary doing? Nothing. <laughs> She's just sitting there doing nothing, right? And, and so, so I can only imagine that she kind of looks up and uh, she's, you know, fixing whatever, and she looks up, she's, like, ah, she's over there being lazy, you know, and so kind of looks up, and she keeps giving her those little, little, little um, glances, and, and uh, Mary's not paying her any attention, and we'll talk about that later. She's looking at Jesus, she's fixing on Jesus, she keeps looking up, and then probably those little glances turn into glares, right? It's kind of glaring, you know, getting that evil eye, and, um, and finally, Martha has had it. And so she walks into the room there, and she launches into a verbal attack of Mary, right? No, that's not what she does. She does launch into a verbal attack, but not of Mary. Who does she attack? Jesus. She attacks Jesus. How interesting. Her serving Jesus has actually led her to become so frustrated with Jesus that she's not finding joy in her service. In fact, she has become angry at Jesus while she was trying to serve him. Notice her question. Lord, don't you care about me? I mean, she actually accuses the most compassionate and caring man 
who has ever walked the face of the earth of not caring for her. It's exactly what she says. She says, Lord, you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? I can almost imagine she's doing all of this stuff for Jesus, and yet she's saying, Jesus doesn't even care about me. I mean, look at all the stuff that I'm doing, and, and he doesn't care that my sister's over here and she's not helping me at all. Her serving Jesus has led to frustration with Jesus. And then, after accusing him of not caring, she commands him what to do. She said, look at that. She says, tell her then to help me. She tells Jesus what he ought to do. I mean, this is the pinnacle of frustration. Accuses Jesus of something that he hasn't done, all right, and then tells him what he needs to do to fix the problem. But notice, where does the problem lie in Martha's mind? With Jesus and Mary. You see, she doesn't say, Jesus, help me. I'm becoming frustrated while I'm trying to serve you. Can you help me? Because apparently I'm, something I'm doing is wrong. Oh, no. In her mind, everything she's doing is right. Everyone else is doing what's wrong. I mean, do I even have to stop and say, have we ever been in that situation before? I mean, how practical is this story? Now, maybe Jesus hasn't been in our home, you know, asking for a meal and we haven't been trying to serve in this particular way, but it's very likely that if you've walked with Jesus, you've been a Christian, a follower of Christ any length of time, and you've tried to serve him, sometimes that service has led to frustration. And not just with yourself or even with other people, sometimes that frustration is even directed towards Jesus himself. Jesus, I've done these things for you. Do you not care for me? Do you not care for me? Why did she become frustrated? Well, there's a very important word here. Verse 40, but Martha was what? Distracted. She was distracted. Doesn't look like she's distracted, does it? I mean, she is focused in on serving Jesus. I mean, this is going to be the best meal she's ever fixed. It doesn't seem like she's distracted. It looks like she's focused. The problem is that she's focused on the wrong thing. She's focused on the wrong thing. That word that um, we have, distracted, this Greek word that's used here, it literally means to be pulled away. It means to be pulled away. So what's happening is that Martha, apparently, is being pulled away by her serving from what is more important than the serving. Her trying to do something for Jesus is pulling her away from something that's more important than that. What could be more important than serving Jesus? Let me say this and, and, and hear this. Being busy for Jesus is not the same thing as being devoted to Jesus. Being busy for Jesus is not the same thing as being devoted to Jesus. But sometimes we make those equal. As followers of Christ, we think the busier I am for Jesus, the more committees I serve on in the church, uh, the, the more, the more um, uh, Sunday school classes I teach, or the more times I, my, the better my attendance is at Sunday school, or the more times I study my Bible, or the more times I pray, or whatever, you fill in the blank, we think the more of that I do, the more devoted I am to Jesus. And yet, that's not the case. Again, are we saying those things are bad? Absolutely not. It wasn't bad that Martha was wanting to serve a meal for Jesus. This just wasn't the most important thing. She was focused on serving and meeting those expectations of her. She was the hostess. It was expected of her to do what she was doing. Yet those things pulled her away. We will be tempted to neglect Jesus. But what about Mary? What about Mary? Our second truth this morning is this. Even though we'll be tempted to neglect Jesus, you must, we must resolve to focus on Jesus. It's a very simple passage of Scripture. We will be tempted to neglect Jesus, and yet we must resolve to focus on Jesus. Let's look at Mary for just a minute. We've been looking at Martha, but let's look at Mary. What is she doing? Verse 39, And she, Martha, had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. I want you to notice the position of Mary. She is seated, seated, let me get my English right, she is seated 
at Jesus' feet. This was the position of a disciple. This was the position of someone who realized this person here has something that I need and I'm going to sit here and take in and soak in everything that I need from this person. This person doesn't need anything from me. I need something from this person. Paul, um, we learn in Acts chapter 22, verse 3, when he was still Saul, says that he was instructed at the feet of Gamaliel. It just means that's, when it says instructed at the feet of Gamaliel, that's a position of a disciple. Gamaliel was his teacher, okay? It was, it was the guy that Saul trained under as a Pharisee. And so he sat at his feet. That means that he learned from this teacher. He soaked up everything he knew. We find um, after Jesus um, heals a man from being possessed by demons, the townspeople come, and this man who had been wild and crazy, they find him seated at the feet of Jesus. The man who, the, the man who, had, who had cast these demons out, Jesus, this God-man, the demon-possessed man realized, this man has something that I need, and so I'm going to sit at his feet. I'm not going to run around and do something for him. First, I'm going to let him do something for me. That's exactly where we find Mary. She is submitting herself to Jesus. There's something else about this that's kind of interesting. Mary's a woman. And in this day and time, a woman wouldn't have sat at the feet of a man as his disciple. And yet, while Martha, her sister, is doing what's expected of her in her culture, fixing the meal serving those in her house, Mary throws aside all cultural expectations. She just casts them out the window because Jesus is in her house, and he is the most important thing. And so we find her seated at the feet of Jesus. Now, what about their responses? What about their response, uh, Jesus' response, excuse me? I mean, Jesus sees Martha. She's serving. She's doing everything she thinks she needs to do. Sees Mary, she's not doing anything except sitting at his feet. Well, which one? We would, we would almost, as I read this, I would expect Jesus to say, Martha, thank you so much for how much you're serving. I mean, I'm so glad that when we walked in here, you just immediately got up and went to doing things for, for me and trying to, trying to serve me. I, I'm telling you, you get the gold star for service. That's kind of what we might would think. And yet he looks at Martha and he says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. You are anxious and troubled about many things. Our service to Jesus is never meant to cause anxiety and trouble our hearts. The reason that her service to Jesus is causing these things in her heart is because she's lost sight of what is most important. But then he looks at, but then he, he kind of turns his attention to Mary. He says, but one thing is necessary. You're anxious and troubled about a lot of different things. And they're good things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. One thing is necessary. Martha probably thought that she would be satisfied in her serving Jesus. You know, that's really the opposite of frustration and satisfaction. And yet Martha was so far from being satisfied. And yet Mary was the most satisfied person in that house. She had chosen the good portion. That, that phrase, good portion, literally means the right meal. Notice what Jesus is doing? Martha is most likely fixing a meal. And yet he tells Martha, Mary has chosen the right meal. She has chosen that, that which will satisfy. What is it? What is that one thing? What is that thing that will satisfy us? That even our serving Jesus, we're not talking about all the material things or even sin that we could get caught up in that we would be tempted to be satisfied by. We're talking about the good things, even church things, Jesus things, serving him that we think that we can be satisfied, that our souls will be satisfied if we do this for Jesus and do this for Jesus and do this for Jesus. And yet that's not the right meal. 
We can't be satisfied with doing things for Jesus. The only way we can be satisfied is to sit at the feet of Jesus and let him do for us what only he can do. I can't help but maybe think that Jesus was remembering those words that he told to Satan in the wilderness. For man does not live by bread alone, but by the very words of God. That's the meal that Mary had chosen. To sit at God's feet and let him do for her what only he could do. And yet I wonder how often in our lives, as followers of Christ, we get so caught up in, I need to do this for God. I need to serve God in this way. That we lose sight of why Jesus came, and that was to give himself for us. Jesus doesn't need our service. He's not sitting around going, I really wish that this person would serve me because I just can't get anything done on earth because they just won't serve. I mean, I'm just so in need. Jesus isn't in need. We have the opportunity and privilege to serve him, but we are the needy ones. We are the ones that need Jesus. And yet if we're not careful, we'll trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior We receive salvation, and then as we grow in Christ, we begin to serve him. And yet that service of Jesus, whatever area God's called you to serve, it becomes frustrating, and it's not satisfying, and we get get troubled in our hearts. And then we go to Jesus and say, Jesus, don't you care what's going on? I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to do these things. I think Jesus might would say, son or daughter, Just stop for a minute. You're doing all these things for me. And that's that's great. But when was the last time you sat at my feet and let me pour myself into you? Because that's where ultimate satisfaction is found. It's by having our lives filled with Jesus. And you know what? When that happens, then we will go out and serve but we'll be serving for the right reason. Not looking to be satisfied in our serving, but looking to be satisfied by the one whom we are serving. Mary chose the right portion. I mean, in their house sat Jesus Christ, the God-man. Just a few verses earlier, um, verse 23 of chapter 10 Uh, Jesus says, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Talking to his disciples. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear. He's saying for thousands of years of prophets and kings who have longed to look at the face of the Messiah. and, And now you're getting to do that. And then just a few verses later, here is that Messiah in Martha's home and she's missing him. All because she's trying to serve him. That good thing pulled her away from the most important thing. What what my desire for us this morning is, is, is simply this. I want us to resolve by God's help and power, because we can't do it on our own, to focus on Jesus. And there are ways that we do that. The primary way that we do that It's through God's word. I love what Wayne said earlier about resolving to to, to read God's word more, spend more time studying the Bible. If I could just give you a couple practical ways, if you say, well, I want to focus on Jesus, how do I do that? Okay, how do I focus on Jesus? It's his word. And so three ways, maybe, that you could think about. Um, And you can put more... You can put more practical um, things with this depending on your situation and your schedule and your family and that kind of thing. But if we're going to focus on Jesus more, we've got to spend more personal time in his word. And so somehow, some way, I encourage you, spend more time this coming year reading God's word for yourself. If you need some help with that, I'll be glad to help you. But if you just start in the Gospel of John, read about Jesus. The best way to focus on Jesus is to read about him. Read about his life. Read about what he said. Read about what he did. Read about the sacrifice that he made for us. Focus on Christ through reading his word on your own. 
But I would take it a step further. What about your family? How can, how can, you, how can your family focus on Jesus? I would say, read God's word as a family. Maybe you do that. Maybe you've never done that. As a new year, great time to start. You don't have to try to read the whole Bible at one time. A couple of verses a day. It's a blessing to read God's word as a family. Focus on Jesus as a family. But then, take it a step further than that. And we ought to be studying God's word together as a church family. And so taking advantage of opportunities to sit at the feet of Jesus together as a church. I pray that's what we do every time we get together. Whether it's a a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, a Wednesday night, some other special time we get together. Whenever this word is open, I want us to sit at Jesus' feet and soak up everything that he desires to give us so that we will be satisfied in Christ. So that then we can go out and serve him but for the right reason. I encourage you, um, take advantage of opportunities our church has for you to study God's word together with brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't know, maybe you're not really involved in a Sunday school class. Resolve to get involved. Find one. We got some. If we run out of room, we'll start some new ones. All right? There's nothing wrong with that. Maybe it's being more committed to be here on a Sunday morning or, or, or come on Sunday nights or, or, or Wednesday nights. We're, we're studying through different psalms right now and spending time in prayer on Wednesday nights. Maybe you want to come and join us then. Take advantage of opportunities to sit at the feet of Jesus. If you haven't heard anything else that I've said, hear this. What you do for Jesus will never satisfy. What you do for Jesus will never satisfy you. The only thing that will satisfy you is Jesus himself. Ultimate satisfaction is not found in what we do for Jesus. It's found in what Jesus has done for us. And so if our service to Jesus as Christians ever takes the place of the gospel in our lives, and what Christ has done for us on the cross, we will find ourselves in Mary's shoes, anxious and troubled by many things. Maybe that's where you find yourself today. It's easy to get there. Maybe you kind of pulled off from the gas pump and left left, left the handle in your car, kind of made a mess of things, got distracted. It happens. It happens. This is something we constantly have to come back to and say, God, help me fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. Because it's easy to get distracted, even by good things. So ask yourself this morning, what's distracting me? What's distracting me from just sitting at Jesus' feet? It might even be a good thing. It might even be a good thing. We're going to have a time of invitation in just a moment. And... um, a uh, time of sing, uh, singing a song. We're singing a song about uh, um, uh, turning our eyes upon Jesus. Uh, it's one of my favorite songs. And, uh, and, and here's what I want us to do. To really, uh, I want you to think about this. As we sing, maybe right there where you're sitting, you just need to kind of bow your head and you need to say, God, um, I've been distracted just from being satisfied in Jesus. Even by, I've just been distracted even by good things. And I need you to help me. In this coming year, help me not to be distracted by these things. Help me to fix my eyes on Christ. Help me to spend time sitting at Jesus' feet, studying his word by myself, with my family, with my church family. Maybe you just need to bow your head during this time and, 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 and pray that prayer to God. Maybe there's some other decision that God, through his Holy Spirit, has laid on your heart this morning. It's a time for obedience. That's what this is. An invitation time. It's a time, time for us to be obedient. Whatever God has laid on your heart. You need to come down and, and share something with me, and I, I'll be glad to pray with you. You need to come down front and pray down here. You pray in your seat. Whatever you need to do, you be obedient to what God has called you to do today in response to his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this account that you have given us from the life of Jesus when he was here on this earth. 
And God, it's it's an all too familiar account for me. Father, how often have I been distracted, even by good things, from the most important thing? How often have I been a, a Martha? God, even reading your word, sometimes I'm a Martha. God, even sometimes when I, when I read your word and I study your word, I just do it just kind of because I'm supposed to or kind of check it off the list. That's not going to satisfy me. God, even as I open up your word, help me to sit at your feet and listen to you. God, as a church, help us to sit at the feet of Jesus and soak up all he has to give us because we are so in need of him. And then... Let our satisfaction in Jesus lead us to serve him with hearts that are focused on him and not on ourselves. Father, maybe this morning someone needs just to ask you for forgiveness from being distracted. God, maybe this morning um, someone needs to resolve through your Holy Spirit's power in their life in this coming year to be more focused on Jesus than they have been. Father, perhaps someone here this morning has never even trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. They've been so distracted that they've never even trusted Jesus for salvation. Father, I pray that you convict their hearts of that this morning and that you would lead them to faith and repentance to trust in Christ. Father, whatever you're calling us to do, God, would we be obedient? In Jesus' name.